new economy, same kind of situation John Wesley faced, where there's no respect for religion, and understandably so, where the established churches are so ingrained with their own corruption and self-infatuated <coughs> that anybody who tells the truth is not welcome. Only now it is not simply the Anglicans. It is the Methodists who were supposed to be antithetical to that. That was the raison d'etre. That's why they existed. Now the Methodists don't want anybody who believes what John Wesley believed. It is my blessing and privilege to introduce to you my dear friend and our brother, who is a Methodist preacher, who does believe what John Wesley believed. Please welcome John Wesley. Right. This is something John Wesley didn't have problems with. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to uh, try to uh, address that a little bit this, this morning. And I'll be looking at, at two passages of Scripture, particularly Psalm 31, which... Andy Stanley might not be too happy about it because it's from the Old Testament. And Luke chapter 21, uh, also, which is the words of Jesus um, in the Olivet Discourse. So I'm just going to take one verse at the moment from 31. I know all about not taking things out of context. I'm going to read it. But this particular verse, 24 of Psalm 31 is what I really want to be saying to you today. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who hope in the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who hope in the Lord. We heard this morning, didn't we, that uh, Paul had said that in the last days perilous times would come. And you kind of expect the next bit will be about, you know, all sorts of really terrible things happening. But in the list, it's like people being lovers of themselves and disobedient to their parents and so on and so forth. And if anything describes our generation, that's it, isn't it? We're living in perilous times. And it, it would be very easy to be anxious, to go and hide, to uh, keep your light hidden, to not put your head above the parapet, and it's what a lot of Christians are doing. How often I've heard, why don't Christian leaders say something about this or about that or the other? Well, the answer is they get shot down immediately in flames, wouldn't they? And they don't want to do that. And so this verse here, be strong and let your heart take courage. You who wait on the Lord is for all of us. Not just for Christian leaders, but for all of us at a time like this. If you were alive 50 years ago, and I was because I'm 71, but I know there's a lot of young people here and they can't imagine this, but 50 years ago, would you ever have thought that there would come a time when people wouldn't know what male and female was? <laughs> would you ever have imagined that there would come a time when people didn't know what marriage was? And would you imagine that in the UK, you would be able to change your birth certificate to tell a lie about what sex you are, or what gender you are. Uh, it's just utterly unimaginable that so long ago, people would have even imagined what was about to happen. 
could you imagine that the government would be backing the teaching of LGBT issues to four-year-olds in school? And would you imagine that right and wrong were being redefined the way they are so that you could be classed as being homophobic and you could lose your job? Or you might be running a little bed and breakfast place in Cornwall and you could end up in front of a court in London uh, to be hauled over the coals because you wanted to, to run that B&B &B &B in accordance with what the Bible teaches about marriage and about uh, relationships. But that's happened in our generation. However, those 50 years or more ago, there were people warning. There was a man called Alexander Solzhenitsyn, and he said this, the West is on the verge of collapse, created by its own hands. Between good and evil, there is an irreconcilable contradiction. One cannot build one's life without regard to this distinction. And another guy, and I don't know whether I'm pronouncing his name right or not, but Peterim Sorokin, he's a sociology professor, Russian-American, said this, the nation that tolerates sexual anarchy is endangering its very survival. So picture the scene. Imagine you're running this B&B, &B and... Uh, Somebody complains, you won't let two men sleep in a double bed together. And uh, before you know it, this tiny little uh, town becomes famous. It's on the front page of the newspapers and, and people are tut tutting and people are thinking, well, what a cranky couple and so on. I guess some people had a sneaking admiration for them. But how would you cope with that if that was you? Uh, supposing you were a registrar and you were expected to marry gay couples but your conscience wouldn't allow you to do that so you ask for a dispensation so that you don't have to do that. This lady lost her job. Imagine a couple hauled up before courts because, and it was a four year journey by the way was this, because they didn't Put, they weren't prepared to bake a cake and put on it, support gay marriage. Four years, you imagine, you imagine the, pr the price of this in personal uh, cost of it before four years later the court exonerates them and they go free. By the way, I was reading, you know, when these things happen, this is your opportunity. <laughs> to witness. What a witness, wasn't it? Daniel and Amy MacArthur standing there before the cameras and being beamed out to all the world and talking about Jesus. He's, he's with us. See, in times of trial and trouble, we always have to recognize God's plan and God's hand. And uh, our lives are not random. Uh, we're, we belong to the Lord. We belong to him. Our times are in his hands. And so, you know, when Paul was in prison, I'm sure he would rather have been out, on, uh, out with the, the church or out on the hillsides witnessing to the gospel or out in, in Athens and t telling people about Jesus. He could have thought prison was a disaster. But because of his imprisonment, we have the letters, don't we? So what we always have to keep in in our minds is the perspective. And I have to tell you this morning that God loves you so much. Jesus said, I, I, I'm not going to say, you can ask me, I'll say, the Father himself loves you because you love me. We have to keep the perspective right. And the God who has his hand upon our life is not going to say, I don't know them. <laughs> I don't care about this B&B &B in Cornwall. I'm not so bothered about Daniel and Amy MacArthur. They can fall. It doesn't matter to me. And he's not going to say it to you either. So be strong. 
and let your heart take courage, you who wait upon the Lord. Because inevitably, these things are going to impact on believers in Jesus, and increasingly so in these days. And the kind of dilemmas that we're in, Jesus warned us about. In the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So let me just read a few verses from Psalm 31. Because you see, these people, men of God, walked these ways before us. The psalmist says, In you, O Lord, I have taken what? Refuge. Let me never be ashamed. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me quickly. Be to me a rock of strength, a stronghold to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, you will lead me and guide me. Can you say that? Of yourself. For you are my strength. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have Ransom me, O Lord, God of truth. I'm going on to verse 14. But as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Make your face to shine upon your servant. Save me in your loving kindness. Let me not be put to shame, O Lord, for I call upon you. Let the wicked be put to shame. Let them be silent in Sheol. Let the lying lips be mute, which speak arrogantly against the righteous with pride and contempt. How great is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you, which you have wrought for those who take refuge in you before the sons of men. You hide them in the secret place of your presence from the conspiracies of man. You keep them secretly in the shelter, in shelter from the strife of tongues. Blessed be the Lord, for he has made marvelous his loving kindness to me in a besieged city. As for me, I said in my alarm, I'm cut off from before your eyes. Nevertheless, you heard the voice of my supplications when I cried to you. O oh, love the Lord, all you his godly ones. The Lord preserves the faithful and fully recompenses the proud doer. Be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who hope in the Lord. There was a lady who stood up here this morning, just forget her name, what was it? Uh, and she said, that's a, that's a command, leclerca. That's a command. This is a command. Be strong. See, we, we think that we're supposed to go with our feelings. And we heard a little bit about that in, uh, in terms of, of how the church manages its teaching now. But God commands. I used to say to my congregation, God doesn't ask you to do something. Because if he does... You have a choice. He commands. And he, the things he commands are, you would think, well, you know, you can't command that. For instance, love your enemies. <laughs> or or uh, husbands, love your wives. I mean, aren't you supposed to be outside looking up into a starry sky and the moonlight and, and you just fall in love? <laughs> But the Bible commands, love your wives, and, and so on and so forth. And here it commands this. Now, let me ask you, when would this command be important? When the opposite would be likely to be what you decide. You know, when the challenges you face is so great, when the enemies are so big, the giants... Be strong 
and let your heart take courage. I just think this is interesting. I mean, the Bible talks about the heart, you know, that seat of, of the real you, shall we say. But it, this, this pump is affected by you t- not taking courage. If you want to sit at home and worry, you, you'll end up with heart trouble probably or something like that. Be strong and let your heart take courage. And this is the key. You who wait upon the Lord. It's not automatic. I've heard so often in my Christian life, let go and let God, uh, but I've tried to find it in the Bible. I can't find it. (laughs) Even, even in that fantastic event where God said to the Israeli people, Jewish people, you won't have to fight. He didn't say, Sit down, get yourself a deck chair, and you'll be all right. He said, put the choir on the front row. You'll always have something to do. You will never be told, let go and let God. Your faith is going to be shown. And when when all seems lost, think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And, And there's no way you can be rescued. When I went to a, one of the Methodist churches that I, I've been pastor of, in a place in Norwich, they had a Bible study that took place there, but it wasn't a Bible study that any of you would have gone to, I don't think. But I went to it, and they were, they were, they were talking about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And this guy said, now we all know this can't happen. I said, well, how do we know that? He said, I'm a physicist, and I teach, I teach A-level in schools, and I know it can't happen. Well, uh, it did. <laughs> so it's not automatic, folks. You know, when you get up in the morning, you're going to meet challenges. And increasingly so, as our country goes down, 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 that's the way it's going, although we think we're going up, up, well, we don't, but... (laughs) It's not going to be automatic. Be strong is the command. But God never commands anything that he doesn't give you the strength to do. And God's looking for courageous men and women who in these days will put their head above the parapet. I don't mean in an arrogant and lawless and uh, and obnoxious way, but nevertheless, I just, you know, give you an example. Daniel MacArthur will put their head above the parapet and will say, well, this is the reason we decided we wanted to be faithful to the Lord Jesus and he is with us. We're sure. How many preachers got on the telly to say that that week? How many people were highlighted on the BBC that week with that message? Isn't it amazing? This couple with a bakery ended up being God's spokespeople for thousands of people. But if we want to know about Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, we have to... We have to go back. We haven't to start in Daniel chapter 3. Oh, no. See, in Daniel chapter 3, there was a 90-foot statue, which was 90 foot tall and 9 feet wide and would frighten the living daylights out of anybody. And Nebuchadnezzar has said, when you hear these musical instruments, you'd all better bow down, (laughs) because if you don't, you're going to be thrown in a fiery furnace. And these... Three guys didn't, and people who hated them decided to tell the king. And you can imagine that that event so frightening for them. It was frightening for everybody else. A fiery furnace, and Nebuchadnezzar, very confident that he was the one who had control of everything, says to them, okay. I'll give you a chance. If you're prepared to bow when you hear this this, uh, musical cacophony, then well and good. 
But if not, you'll be thrown in the fiery furnace and what God could deliver you? I think he was a physicist. <laughs> and they said, they said, well, O oh king, our God is able to deliver us, but if he doesn't, this is the Lancashire version. I'm not reading it from the scripture. <laughs> if he doesn't, we will not bear down before. And this king wasn't used to people uh, doing that. But we're jumping the gun. A long time before this, in Daniel chapter 1, Daniel and his three friends had decided they were in a foreign country, long way from home, but they weren't going to forget their God. They weren't going to forget the scriptures. They weren't going to forget what God had told them. They were going to remain faithful no matter what. And in a much less threatening situation, although, you know, the guy was looking after him could have been executed, they put it to the test. We don't want the king's rich food and the king's drink. Just give us vegetables. And then 10 days later, they look better than the others. So I don't know what they were feeding them. But anyway, so they, they faced it in a small way first. And then when the big test came, they stood. Now, we all have to be careful, don't we? We remember Peter. <laughs> oh, Lord, I, I could understand. Yes, Lord, I understand all these ne'er-do-well disciples here. But you can trust me. I will never let you down. None of us can say this, can we? All we can say is, Lord, please help me to stand. Give me the strength to stand, no matter whether it's a fiery furnace or a court of law in London or, or the newspapers knocking at your door or whatever. Give me the strength to stand, Lord. Not in my strength. There was an old hymn that said, the arm of flesh will fail you. You dare not trust your own. But did you remember what it says in this verse? You who wait on the Lord. So in the small challenges of life, be faithful. And if you're faithful in the small challenges of life, God might entrust something a little bit more frightening to you. <laughs> but be strong, because God will always have an outcome of his choosing that will be far bigger than anything you've ever thought of. So here we go, perspective. We always need to remember where we've come from. Do you ever think, why did those 12 spies get it so wrong? Well, 10 of them. I mean, they had seen God's hand at work in an amazing way. He had delivered the people out of the hands of the most powerful nation on earth at that time. And not only that, he had taken them through a sea, opened up, and the way was there, and they went through, and then the sea closed on their enemies. They had stood at the bottom of a mountain <laughs> and heard the voice of God. They had been given his commandments, and then he had brought them all the way to the promised land. But that's where their faith failed. They went in. There were giants. <laughs> Oh, yeah, it was a great place, but oh, no, we could never take that, 10 of them said. And, and so ten, they didn't take it, those 10. The two who said, yeah, we are well able to. Remember where God's brought us from all this time. Remember how we got here. Do you know any other nation that this has happened to? Give me 10 times when the sea has opened and the nations walk through it's never happened before so you find the children of israel eventually they're building their the, when they go through the jordan they take the stones and they build a pillar to remind them that god had brought them through all the way and you see this so many times in scripture maybe this is why joshua 
did what he did at the end of his life. I'm looking at Joshua chapter 24. You can just listen if you like or look it up. Joshua chapter 24. This is at the end of Joshua's life. And he's, he's doing a bit like John was talking about with, uh, with the Apostle Paul in Acts 20, where he gathered the elders together. Because he knew jolly well what they were like. Some of them were going to end up as wolves in sheep's clothing. And so he lays it on thick here for the children of Israel because he knows he's coming to the end of his life. And he says, verse 14, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. And put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods, for the Lord our God is he who brought us brought us and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt and from the house of bondage and who did these great signs in our sight and preserved us through all the way in which we went and among all the peoples through whose midst we passed. The Lord drove out from before us all the peoples, even the Amorites who lived in the land. We also will serve the Lord for he is our God. Then Joshua said to the people, you'll not be able to serve the Lord. A bit like Paul says, you know, some of you are going to, some of you, it's going to rise up from your own number, people who are going to uh, lead uh, others astray and speak abominable things. Joshua said, you will not be able to serve the Lord for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgression or your sin. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you harm and consume you after he has done good to you. And the people said to Joshua, no, but we will serve the Lord. Joshua said to the people, you are witnesses against yourselves and you have chosen for yourselves the Lord to serve him. And they said, we are witnesses. Now therefore put away the foreign gods which are in your midst, and incline your hearts to, to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, We will serve the Lord our God, and we will obey his voice. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day, and he made for them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God, and he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to all the people, Behold, this stone shall be for a witness against us, for it has heard all the words of the Lord which he spoke to us. And, it, and thus it shall be a witness against you, so that you do not deny your God. Then Joshua dismissed the people. You know, if I went to the other end of, of Joshua's life, I had come to this in the very first chapter in verse 9. God says to him, Have I not commanded you? I'm sending you. Isn't it me that's sending you? That's important, isn't it? If you're waiting on the Lord, I sent you. Verse 9 then. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. My friends, this morning I want to say to you that no matter how frightened you are about what might be around the corner or the troubles and trials that you're facing in your life, <laughs> if you're a born-again believer in Jesus, if you're walking with the Lord, he's not going to abandon you. He's reminding you, I'm going with you. I'll be with you wherever you go. So, should that make a difference? 
Supposing you thought God wasn't with you, would you be the same if, as if you thought God was with you? This is it. He's with you. Be strong. And let your heart take courage, all you who wait for the Lord. Well, now I'm going to just turn into Luke's Gospel, chapter 21. And I'm starting at verse 5. And while some were talking about the temple and it, it was adorned, sorry, that it was adorned with beautiful stones and votive gifts, he said, As for these things which you are looking at, the days will come in which there will not be left one stone upon another which will not be thrown down. And they question him, saying, Teacher, when therefore will these things happen? And when will be the sign and when we, that these things are about to take place? And he said, See to it that you are not misled. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. And when you hear of wars and disturbances, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first. The end does not follow immediately. Then he continued by saying to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be great earthquakes, and in various places plagues and famines, and there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and will persecute you by delivering you over to synagogues and prisons, bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake. It will lead to an opportunity for you, to te for your testimony. So, make up your mind not to prepare beforehand to defend yourself, for it will be given... I, for I will give you utterance and wisdom which none of your opponents will be able to resist or refute. But you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. And you will be tested by all, because, sorry, you will be hated by, <laughs> this red is difficult to read. You will be hated by all because of my name, yet not a hair of your head will perish. What was that? I thought you said you were push, being put to death. Not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your lives. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by enemies, then recognize that her desolation is near. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains, and those who are in the midst of the city must leave, and those who are in the country must not enter the city, because these are days of vengeance, so that all things which are written will be fulfilled. Woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress upon the land and wrath to the people and they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all nations and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. There will be signs in the sun and moon and stars and on the earth dismay amongst the nations in perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting from fear and the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these things begin to take place, run like mad. Oh, no, it doesn't say that, does it? <laughs> no, it doesn't say that. It says, straighten up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. See, that's the message about being strong. Now, some of this is 
it was fulfilled. And I know all about Jacob's vectors and so on. Well, they're not his, but what he talks about, that, that history isn't just a line like that, but things, you know, there are people in Antichrist spirit. You might say Adolf Hitler and so on. They come and go, and they're just a, they're a picture of what is to come. But some of this was fulfilled when Jerusalem was surrounded by armies uh, of the Romans. And you know what? On one occasion, those armies inexplicably moved back. And people who had remembered Jesus' words escaped. Janice and I went to Israel with Jacob a few years ago, and we went to the burnt house in Jerusalem. And you can see this place, and this guy was telling us that is a severed arm of a woman who, who, who was trying to protect her family. What happened after that was truly horrendous. But some people were rescued. They listened to what Jesus said here. I don't mean they didn't have any more problems for the rest of their life and they could just let go and let God and sit in a deck chair. I mean, they escaped because they took the word of God seriously. Now, some of this hasn't happened, has it? There will be signs in the sun and moon and stars on the earth, dismay amongst the nations in perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting from fear at the expectation of things which are coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And this one hasn't happened yet, but it's getting closer. They will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. So what I'm saying is, our generation, <laughs> it, it, it really grieves me to, to, to speak to pastors who love the Bible, but do not see any role for the nation of Israel. I'm thinking, what? This is happening before your eyes. You're seeing Bible prophecy fulfilled. For 2,000 years, there was no Israel as such. They were scattered throughout the nations, just like it said they would be here. But in my lifetime, the nation of Israel, we are seeing the Bible fulfilled before our eyes. This is why this book is so important, isn't it? We might not be able to, to all agree about how this happens. Does it happen at this time or that time or the other time? But the other morning, I got up uh, in our house in New York, and I went to the window, and the sky was red. It was, it was about 7 o'clock in the morning, and the sky was red. What did I think? <laughs> Don't be shy. It's all about being strong. <laughs> what did I think? Red sky at n night, shepherd's delight. Yeah, but this was morning. Red sky at morning, what? Shepherd's warning. It's going to be a bad day. And Jesus said, look, you can read the signs of the skies. Why can't you read the days in which we live? We are meant to be able to see the signs of the age in which we live. You think of all these catastrophes coming together. You think of Ebola and the plagues. You see these earthquakes increasing, increasing in, uh, in frequency. Yeah, people say, well, they've always been. Yeah, okay. But they're increasing in frequency. And so we're meant to... Read the signs of the times. <laughs> but what if we're afraid? What if we're thinking, well, I could be hauled up before court for making a stand in my workplace, or I could just lose my job, and then how would I pay for my mortgage? Or, or I, could, I could just keep quiet. I could just hide, because I'm afraid. Or we could see the hand of Jesus on our lives, and see, you see, because what he did with Paul was, he put him in prison. <laughs> How do I know that? Well, Paul says, I'm in prison. Of the, the Lord has put me here. Your life isn't random, right? 
So you look around in the circumstances which you'd rather not have, and you look for the Lord and what he's going to do. And you need to know that he loves you. I don't go along with, with these notice boards outside church that say, Jesus love you, because I think people drive past and think, well, of course, they would love, he would love me. I'm very lovable. <laughs> and then they get an idea about God that he doesn't care how they live. So, but it is true Jesus loves, <laughs> but I think there's a little bit more to it. But I can say to you, if you're a real believer in Jesus, if you're a blood-bought child of God, if your sins have been forgiven, I can say to you, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. So don't worry. It doesn't do any good. Look in every situation you're in and remember these words. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Or you who wait on the Lord. Are you waiting on the Lord? You know, he's got a job that's specific to you. He's got a, he hasn't made anybody that are, is useless. <laughs> Some people tell me, I have no gifts, you know. I, I couldn't do this or I couldn't do that. That's irrelevant. <laughs> What's he called you to do? What's he made you to do? I mean, to me, it's a really great encouragement. Can you, can you bear hearing about me just a short time? <laughs> Before I was born, my mum's uncle gave a Bible to her and said, your child's going to be a preacher. Wow. <laughs> and so I've got the Bible at home. Uh, it's very battered, but I've had it rebound and things like that to remind me. See, reminding you of what God has done in the past, that's enough about me reminding you about what God has done in the past is part of God's helping you to stand strong when the next challenge comes, when the, the bigger challenge, when the giant comes, when, when the, the walled cities are there and you think, well, this is a very fertile place, but we could never take these cities, you know, like the 12, 10 spies. When the next challenge comes, you take strength from, you know, like setting up that pillar, so Samuel did it. He, he set up a pillar, 1 Samuel 7 verse something or other, 14 I think, and he sets up this pillar and he calls it Ebenezer. Hitherto, thus far, the Lord has helped us. Do you ever look at your life and think, you know, looking back it's a wonder I'm still following Jesus. Every year at the Methodist Conference, I know you'll like to hear about that. <laughs> they sing a hymn every year, but it goes back to the early days of Methodism. I want you to just listen to these three verses. Don't worry, I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> what troubles have we seen? What conflicts have we passed? Fightings without and fears within since we assembled last. But out of all, the Lord has brought us by his love, and still he doth his help afford and hides our life above. Let us take up the cross till we the crown obtain and gladly reckon all things loss, that we may Jesus gain. Amen. You see, they might have forgotten what all that's about. In comfortable Christianity, you don't really think the next year, oh, it's a wonder we're still here after all the troubles we've been through. That's comfortable Christianity. But in the days that were being described by John a few minutes earlier, where, where or was it? might have been, no, sorry, it might have been Jacob, where mobs were surrounding the door. One day, a mob surrounded the door, and they were going to kill John Wesley. And he came downstairs, <laughs> opened the door, and walked down. They all, like, they didn't know what to do next. Um, 
but he could have been killed. Lots of people have been killed. So these Methodists, these early Methodists, whenever John Wesley, they're called Methodists because they do everything, they're supposed to do everything methodically, you see. So John Wesley would gather them together at a certain time in the year and he would, they would sing a hymn like this. This is a Charles Wesley hymn. What troubles have we seen? Are you expecting to see any troubles? <laughs> Are you expecting to have to put your armour on? Do you think the Christian life is some kind of cruise ship holiday somewhere? Or are you in a battle? What troubles have we seen? What conflicts have we passed? Fightings without and fears within since we assembled last. But out of all, the Lord has brought us by his love and still he does his help afford and hides our life above. So, this is their being strong. Let us take up the cross till we the crown obtain and gladly reckon all things lost that we may Jesus gain. Amen. There's four things I want to leave with you from this. The first is this. Looking back is important. Oh, I don't mean putting your hands to the prow and looking back, but I mean, I mean considering the journey that you've been on considering God's hand, thinking about the terrible things that you've thought or done or anything, and yet how God has brought you out of that, how he's steered your life. You know, we can hear a testimony from somebody who's been a drug addict and, and instantly been, been set free. But lots of drug addicts, it takes a lot of time. But God is, Jesus is setting people free. If you have a, a testimony like that, when I was in college, there was a, a guy there called Norman Smith who used to be drunk out of his, not, not in college, drunk out of his mind on a, uh, most weeks, weekends. And he heard this preacher and he got converted and he, his life was transformed. I don't know what your story is. It won't be like mine. It won't be like anybody else's. But, but remember. And remember the lives of others as well. And that great hymn, Amazing Grace, it says, Through many dangers, toils and snares, I have already come. Tis grace has brought me safe thus far and will probably drop me now. I th oh no, I know I don't think it says that, does it? And grace will, bring, will lead me home. And remember his promises. See, I wasn't making any, I wasn't making fun of the verse in eight, verse 18 of Luke chapter 21. It's what Jesus said and it's what he means. Not a hair of your head will perish. He said this, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. So they've been killed, but they haven't died. <laughs> God is the God of the living, not of the dead. And gloriously, even that dead body will be raised. God's got your DNA, knows you. Not a hair of your head. Remember his promises. Go through his promises. I don't mean, I don't mean promise box Christianity. I hope I'm not going to upset people here, but it has been known. You know, where you, where you have a pair of tweezers and you go and you get a promise out. You never get out, sell all you have and give to the poor. And, Having said that, the promises of God are immense, aren't they? You know, just think about what God has given you. And you ain't seen nothing yet. Yes, amen. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, and it hasn't entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. That's two. Three, emulating the heroes of faith. When the writer to the Hebrews wrote what is now, he didn't write in chapters, but it's chapter 11. All those heroes of faith, some of them were rescued. Some of them were, one of them was sawn in two. 
but they're the heroes of the faith and they gave testimony to God, faithful to the end. And he's writing that so that we'll want to emulate them. We we'll want to stand strong. We won't want to be weak and cowardly and frightened and running because the world needs to see genuine Christian people and how they face troubles and trials and suffering and pain. And then, of course, fourthly, we're expecting his return. Yes. And, you know, when he comes back, he says, blessed is that servant who his master finds doing what he said. In, in Hebrews, it says he's coming for those who are eagerly waiting for him. There was a little <laughs> railway mission in Crewe that I used to go and preach at sometimes when I was in Cheshire. And it said, maybe today over over the pulpit. He's coming. And I know I've listened to Jacob saying how, how stupid it is that as you get closer to his coming, not less people are interested in it. He's coming back. And you know, if you're still here, he'll come for you. Or if you die, you'll be coming with him back. 1 Thessalonians 4. What a glorious future we have. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. In one of the most wonderful chapters of the Bible, I think, they're all great, of course, but 1 Corinthians 15, he goes through the resurrection of Jesus, and he finishes like this. Therefore, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor is not in vain. And in the book of Revelation, we find Jesus saying, Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. I've had this little card since the day I gave my life to Christ. April the 8th, 1958. Oh, that's a long time ago, isn't it? <laughs> and with this I finish. Unfading glory. That is what awaits us. Glory to pale not, never to grow dim. Glory to last throughout the countless ages of that new life which we shall share with him. Unfading glory, human comprehension fails to conceive what that estate should be. Mind cannot know it, nor could words describe it. Glory eternal, glory endlessly. Meanwhile, perchance, affliction is life's portion. Varied in form, not welcomed as a guest, erringly deemed a burden or disaster, that it might go, we reason, would be best. Stay such affliction, lasting for a moment, worketh the weight of glory yet to be, glory to last throughout the endless ages, unfading glory through eternity. Isn't that brilliant? Be strong, and let your heart take courage, or you who wait for the Lord, even in these days.